Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for this introduction to IPSAS 48 Transfer Expenses. My name is Eileen Zhou and I'm a principal at the USASB. With me today is Edwin Ng, who is also a principal at the USASB. So Edwin, sounds like the board has had an incredibly productive start to the year. Yes, the IPSASB approved a number of new standards at its March meeting, including IPSAS 48, a new standard on transfer expenses. So can you tell me a bit more about what exactly transfer expenses are? A transfer expense is an expense arising from a transaction other than taxes, where the transfer provider provides a good, service, or other asset to another entity without receiving anything in return. Before IPSAS 48, there was no explicit guidance on these transactions in the IPSAS. The IPSASB had previously released an exposure draft on transfer expenses back in early 2020 as part of a package with the two revenue exposure drafts. Back then, the proposed accounting largely mirrored the revenue proposals, and the accounting was driven by whether the transfer transaction contained a performance obligation. So what has changed since the exposure draft? Well, constituents noted that consistency in principles between revenue and transfer expenses was good, but they questioned whether the proposed mirror accounting was appropriate. This was because there could be cases where the transfer provider does not have access to all of the same information as the transfer recipient. Other constituents noted that the accounting for transfer expenses should really be based on the perspective of the transfer provider on a standalone basis. Based on these comments, the board decided to rebuild the standard based on the underlying principle that the accounting for a transfer expense depends on whether the transaction gives the transfer provider an enforceable right to have the transfer recipient satisfy their obligations. Such an enforceable right results in the recognition of an asset, and this asset is subsequently expensed as the transfer right is extinguished. So how would this underlying principle be applied in practice? To operationalize the principle, the IPSASB decided to leverage the revenue standard and incorporate the concept of a binding arrangement into the transfer expenses standard. Yes, I'm familiar with that concept because essentially a binding arrangement is an arrangement that confers both rights and obligations that are enforceable either legally or through equivalent means uh, on the parties within the arrangement, right? Right. In the context of transfer expenses, if the transaction arose from a binding arrangement, the enforceable right from that binding arrangement would meet the definition of an asset. After transferring the resources in accordance with the arrangement, the transfer provider would recognize a transfer right asset, and this asset would be expensed when or as the enforceable right is extinguished. Typically, this happens when the transfer recipient satisfies its obligations as specified in the binding arrangement. There could also be situations where the transfer recipient satisfies its obligations before resources are transferred. And when this happens, the transfer provider would have to recognize a liability for its enforceable obligation to transfer resources. So what happens when the transfer is without a binding arrangement? Every transaction will be different, but when a transfer does not involve a binding arrangement, the transfer provider will typically lose control of the resources once it is transferred. This results in an immediate expense since there won't be an enforceable right which could lead to the recognition of an asset. Where there is no binding arrangement, the transfer provider also needs to consider if there is a constructive or legal obligation related to the transfer. For example, a transfer provider could communicate to external parties that it will transfer resources. And this may lead to the recognition of a provision and an expense under IFSAS 19 provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets. So is there anything else in IPSAS 48 that is different from the original exposure draft? Yes, in general, the board tried to clarify the standards as much as possible, and this was done by adding new implementation guidance and a more focused set of illustrative examples. The presentation and disclosure requirements were also streamlined to leverage existing requirements in IPSAS 1. Also, based on the feedback received, the transitional provisions have been revised to allow for a prospective application of the standard. Okay, that's great to hear. So when is IPSAS 48 effective for entities? 
Even though IPSAS 48 is a standalone standard, it does leverage some definitions and principles from IPSAS 47, revenue. Because of this, IPSAS 48 is effective as at January 1st, 2026. Early application is permitted for entities that also apply a new revenue standard at the same time. That's great. Thank you for the summary, Edwin. And thanks everyone for tuning in. You can find additional resources and information at our website, www.ipsasb.org. You may also subscribe to our newsletter or follow us for regular updates. Thank you and goodbye.